Take your Bibles to Matthew 1 and Luke 2. And the reason why I'm saying it like that is I, I, we're going we're gonna to literally go from story, uh, passage to passage. The reason why we have to do that is the Christmas story is combined in both of those. You're going to hear aspects of one uh, part of the story that you're not going to hear in the other passage. So it's important for us to view uh, this message from both parts. And uh, I, I'm labeling this living life with Jesus. Living life with Jesus, and I'll explain why, and I think this is very important, not only in the application of where I want to take you at the end of the service for us as a church, but you as an individual. Because I'll tell you, one of the hardest things that I have to answer when people come to me as a pastor is, if I'm doing everything right, why is everything so hard? Why is it that if God is with me and God's promised to be with me and He'd never leave me and He's going to guide me through it, He's going to make a way and all this then why is life a constant struggle? And I'm saying, if just getting personal with, with you guys, it's like with, in, in life, in every aspect of it, it's, it's not just like I'm living in sin, I'm doing this. You're, you're thinking, I'm trying to raise family and I'm struggling. You, you know, it's just, I'm doing all the right steps. And I, I've heard that from so many teen parents that say, I have kept my kids in church. Uh, They know the Word of God. They've grown up in Awana. They've gone through junior church. They've been in the teen class. And for some reason, this is just stressful. I can't get them to get this. How how do we get to the point in life where life just starts getting simple or easy or making sense? Because life is not easy. I've heard people take it as far to say, I just don't think that God likes me or I don't think that God thinks that I'm doing anything right or, or whatever it might be. And I've looked at past preachers just from my perspective of, and I, I, I see them uh, in the past and think, man, look at what God did. Get, they had anointing on their life and they went through all these things and they, they built this and done this and led this and all this. And you're just thinking, man, when I look at my ministry, it just seems like an uphill battle. Everything, there's just challenges all the time. And then I get into this passage. And the truth of the matter is, it's just a matter that everybody's there. We just can't see their battles. On the outside, it looks like they have it all together. Maybe that's you coming in the church and you look around at other people. No, they've got their battles too. Now, Matthew 1.18, and we're just going to talk through the entire Christmas story, but we're going to make application to this. And I, I'm, I'm going to check you guys with every aspect of this Bible story, okay? Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise. We would word it like this. Now, the birth of Jesus happened in this way. It was on the wise. I'm I'm going to let you know. I'm going to lay it out, okay? When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, we we know this story very well. And and I've told people before, one of the biggest challenges of being a pastor and going to the Christmas thing is people expect you to speak on the Christmas story, you know? But at the same time, it's trying to bring a fresh perspective, there's no way that I'm going to tell you this story and anything that you're going to come out and be like, well, I didn't know that before when it comes to the actual story. But I want you to get this. We're going to go through three points. Number one, living life with Jesus does not eliminate problems. You just write that down. Living life with Jesus does not eliminate problems. And there's a good reason for that. And I, I want to bring you guys to the good reason in just a minute. But before you put these two people, Mary and Joseph, on some sort of spiritual level or spiritual high in their life of where they were at, they they had the same problems, challenges that you and I face today. And I want, I'm going to put these into words as we go through this. So uh, look at Luke 130. We're going back and forth, okay? Another perspective of what God was talking to them. And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. So just going to set the stage for you right now. That word favor, there's a lot of different meanings for it, but it means benefit. It means gift or grace. It means joy. It it means that you've been accepted by God. So God literally goes to this woman and says, hey, you're doing things good. God's not going to call somebody, especially to carry out the mission that she was doing when she was way off. So God points this out. I, I need you guys to get that as we go into this. God comes here and says, hey, you are doing good. God's going to use you, bless you, and lead you in a special way. That, that's what was going on. So right now, I'm going, to, I'm going to lay out what they went through, but I'm just going to put it in our terms, okay? I'm just going to lay it out. Number one, or A, underneath this, they had relationship stress. And I'm going to ask you right now, 
it, without raising your hand, how many people in this room right now have relationship stress or problems within their relationship? I brought this out a couple years ago, but let me look at it from this perspective. perspective. Matthew 119. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, wanting to do what's right, just like it's pointed out about her, not willing to make her a public example, but listen to this, was minded to put her away privately. You, you, you talk about starting off this huge mission and plan of God. Mary tells Joseph this huge news about what's going on. Joseph, I'm pregnant, but it's okay because this is all of God and it's God's baby. And I know us looking back at this story from knowing what happens, look forward to this story and think being in those situations. He didn't believe her. And that's, that's the thing. He did not believe her. Do you think to him this was pleasant news? No, I can show you in a few minutes no, that this brought stress, problems, aggravation. It's just here they are in the service of the Lord dealing with relationships that is stressful. This is not easy. How many of you have ever guys have said either with your relationship, your marriage, and turned around and said, this is not easy. I don't understand. It should be easy because we go to church. should be easy because I'm saved. Should be easy because I know the Lord. In one instance, he's losing his future wife. His mind is racing. She must be cheating on me. She is lying. Worse than that, she's blaming God for it. And he is a godly single man with a pregnant fiance. Yeah. Stress, problems, aggravation. You know, I know the song uh, Silent Night. This is probably where it actually came from because I guarantee you in that relationship, it was a silent night. Anyone here, being honest, is dealing with relationship stress right now. And you're just stepping back saying, Lord, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know why we're even dealing with this because I, I, I'm doing everything right. Let me tell you, they were doing everything right. Let me, I, we'll, we'll get to why. There is a big reason why. Number two, they had scheduling conflicts. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this tax, it was first made with Cyrenus, the governor of Syria. And, and it goes through, and you guys know the story, and they all went out to be taxed, everyone into his own city. This, this is all of a sudden a trip for them to take. But jump down to verse 5. Here they are. Mary, we have to go. To be, to be taxed with Mary as a spouse wife being great with child. Now, I just looked up the Greek word for great with child. It's actually one phrase or one word, okay? This isn't my interpretation. It says swelling inside. It's what it means. Great with child, pregnant. I don't know if Joseph would have used that phrase, but the Bible did, telling her. Uh, but the, the idea was that she was very far along. And uh, in this situation, everything about this was not good timing. So all of a sudden, you have... Uh, relationship stress and the next thing that we come to in this story is we realize in the middle of this that this is horrible timing nothing if 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 it was you and I or you were talking to your spouse or your kids or whatever you'd say nothing is working out I don't understand I, I tell you what I thought we had this I'm dealing with this issue me and Mary worked this out God's talking to me and all this and then all of a sudden I have this on top of everything else does that relate to anybody here you know, just saying, this, is, this, this, is, this didn't come at a good time. Mary, Mary is now traveling 80 miles. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but sh- just keep in mind that she was a normal woman. I mean, Mary did not get some sort of double grace because she was pregnant with Jesus. Constant back pains and swollen ankles. This is just the stuff that I've heard, Okay. You can imagine traveling on donkey, going 80 miles, and telling Joseph that she has to go to the bathroom every 10 minutes. Constant heart, heartburn and cravings for food that only made her sick. And on top of that, having a kid inside of her kicking her constantly. They say, well, when we talk about Mary, you're like, oh, how beautiful. And, you know, she, she would have been like, beautiful. What are you talking about? You know, this, this isn't beautiful. What part of this is? Everything in my world is rocked and turned upside down. Nothing is making sick since. It, it, and sometimes in, in our lives when, when we get sick at the wrong time or life comes at us or problems or, you know, they start laying off people at work right after you close on your house. 
This isn't good. Horrible timing. Number three, they had major and sudden life changes. You think about how, many, how often in our life we have major and sudden life changes where God just turns everything upside down just like that. Think, think about it in this story. All of a sudden, their wedding plans had changed. Okay? They didn't have the choice of deciding if or when they were going to have a child. They were being re- relocated on short notice. They were having to move away from their parents. He was having to move away from his job. This is difficulty all over the place. You realize that in one verse, one situation of what God, and I'll remind you, what God said he was going to do, ended up changing everything in their world to the point from the outside or even from them on the inside would say, could things get any worse? I've lost everything. I don't even have my parents to get me through this. I'm traveling. I have stress. Do you trust God when God changes your plans? Number four, letter D. They had financial struggles. One thing that I can show you that they show over and over again in this passage is that they came from a poor city, that this guy was a carpenter. And when it, it, when it explains this girl in Luke 148, for he had regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. Even emphasizing in, in the scripture that these were not rich, they were not royalty. You know, it could be, you know, you'd say, well, this isn't bad. God gave me this job to do, but thank God at least I have the money to do it. Mary and Joseph didn't even have that. They didn't even have that to add to it. Struggles in their life. Next thing, they had provision problems. Luke 2, 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. You know, have you you ever wondered how many doors he knocked? And I know we've demonstrated that, but I'll tell you the frustration of not being able to provide is beyond words for any man that is a leader, any man that's a husband, or any man that has a pregnant wife. I can't take care of you. I am failing. You can imagine door after door, and even going back to your pregnant wife and saying, hey, I got some hay in a stable. You just, you know, that she would He didn't exactly win the hero award at that moment for doing that. Outside, it's one thing. Inside, it's just like, could I not do better? Could I not? And and, I mean, you just think about all these different things that they were going through. How about how about this next one? Letter F. They had inner emotional struggles. Inner emotional struggles. Dealing with it in your mind, in your heart. Luke chapter uh, two, verse thirty-four. They go to the temple. They have baby Jesus. Okay, finally, things are getting better. You know, Joseph, we had a rough beginning. You know, we had all the rumors and we had the problem and you didn't believe me and you almost left me. Then we had the travel. We couldn't find a place. We don't have money. On and on and on. Then they say, well, let's just have a good day. Honey, can we just have a good day? Let's go dedicate him at the temple. Let's bring him in there. I, I just need this, okay? I, I just need to break away and get something good. Luke 2, 34, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for all, for the fall and rising again, many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Verse 35, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Well, that's not the greatest news. You can imagine, hey, I know you don't know the future, but God has told me. The future of this child to you is going to feel like a sword being thrust through your heart and soul. That was the news she got. That was the prophecy of what was to come. Of course, for us, we know that. Have any of you moms ever had to carry a burden about your kids? They're sick? Or they struggle in school? Or, or they have some sort of problem that they don't click with the other kids or whatever, and you just sit there and cry in your room and say, God, God could, why, why do I have to deal with this? Why do I have to carry this burden of knowing that the future isn't great? And I have to sit there and say, wonder what and how? You say, well, they knew that it was of God. They knew that God was in control. Well, let me ask you guys, all his parents and everybody else, did you know that God's in control of your circumstance? But the thing is, being flesh and holding that crying child and having them come home from school or watching them struggle or whatever it is, is not easy. They had inner struggles. I'll show you this in a few other ways as we get into this. How about this? Letter G, and then we'll move on. They had parenting frustration. 
You say, you cannot have parenting frustration with Jesus. And I know all of you guys are like, if Jesus was your child, he is perfect. Do you realize that even though your child is perfect, they were not? So they didn't get everything that was going on. And I'll show you this. I'm I'm just, Luke chapter 2, verse 42. If, If any of you have a junior high boy, you're about to relate to this. They have a junior high boy. And when he was 12 years old, they went up into Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled the days, they returned. The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Okay, so here they are. They just go on like they normally do. Jesus stays back. Now, just asking you guys, did did Jesus do what was wrong? But I tell you, Mary and Joseph did not have a GPS tracker on their boy. Okay, there, there was no way to call him on his cell phone. There's no way to put out a blanket thing on Facebook. Has anybody seen Jesus? It's been a while, whatever. They didn't know. Mom and dad, human being, loved their kid, got a mission from God to make sure that he grows up to do the will of the Father and save the world. So that's a little pressure. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. So it says, all right, I'm sure he's here. Honey, Mary, calm down. He's Jesus, all right? I'm telling you, it's going to be okay. Everything's all right. Honey, I know he's Jesus, but he's my boy. And he's, he's only 12 years old. And uh, honey, it's okay. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. I guarantee you that was a long road. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. Have any of you guys ever turned for a moment and couldn't find your kid before? You know what I'm saying? Forever a moment. And I mean, and, and I, I, I have looked like a crazy man in the store when my kids were little. And I didn't care. I went that moment and said, hello, Morgan, Morgan, Morgan. And then before long, I am screaming. You know, I'm, I'm running down the aisle. I'm thank- and, and you can imagine, they are human. They are parents. And their child is missing. So they literally turn around and they're rushing back to Jerusalem. Listen to this, they found him after three days, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. All good stuff. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, note this, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. They were parents. That, that's what parents do. The word sorrow means to grieve the sorrow or to be tormented. I said, son, I, Jesus, three days. Three days we have been weeping from place to place. Three days we have cried over you. Three days your mom has not been able to sleep wondering where you're at. The Bible includes that in there about raising Jesus, about him being perfect. You say, my kid's not perfect. Then yes, then you have far worse problems than this. Your sorrowing probably exceeds far past this. Now I'm just going to ask you again. What did they have with them? They had Jesus. The whole story of what I told you, every bit of this detail is them having Jesus the whole time. And I just thought of this. All of us have Jesus. And for some reason, we think just because we have Jesus, we're not going to have all these problems. If Mary and Joseph had those problems, I promise you, we're going to have those problems too. And according to this, they did nothing wrong. According to this, they weren't running out to the world or living in sin or whatever. All of these things happen. Listen to verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that thou hast sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. And they understood not the sayings which he spake unto them. You know what it was? They stood back and said, I know that God's doing something, but like us, I don't get it. I don't get it. Lord, I I know, and that's the exact phrasing of what's being here. Jesus turns to them and says, hey, you guys aren't going to get it, but I'm doing what I'm here to do. Everything's okay. But for the heart of Mary and Joseph, they just stood back and said, we don't understand. I I just explained every single one of us. First, Living without Jesus means that we still have problems, okay? Number two, 
Living life with Jesus means we have Jesus in our problems. That, that we, we need to make sure that we get the whole part of this story. You need to understand what's going on here. So I, I, I would like to, to do it like this. And if I could illustrate it, so I'm going to use you guys' as imagination, okay? So I'm going to draw life as a circle. So if you could imagine this, this circle being right here. Pastor Dave, would you mind coming up on the stage with me for just a minute? If you don't mind. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys that, will you mind standing inside the circle? Sure. Do you see it? Okay. It, it, obviously, there's no circle, but let me tell you, in this world that he lives in is the curse. Okay, the, the world is cursed. It, it, it was then, it is now, it will be until God takes us out of here, okay? It's going to be. So you have to understand that as long as Pastor Dave is in the world, or as long as he is living life, he is living in the curse. Mary and Joseph were not pulled out of the world. They were made in there. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about when it comes to something like this. Take, for instance, the same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were on a mission from God, correct? They were doing exactly what God wanted them to do. They had a purpose. They had a reason. Here's what God did. God allowed them to go through the problems of life. But God stepped into the problems with them. That's when they looked in there and said, did we not only throw three men in there? Why is it that I see four and one is of the Son of God? Do you understand what's going on? In that situation, Mary and Joseph were called to carry out the mission in the curse. In the curse. But the matter is, it was a matter of Jesus coming in to the curse because he was here to conquer the curse and get them out of it. The same illustration comes. Later we can see this as the disciples are crossing the sea. And while they're crossing the sea, a great storm arises. They are feeling the rain. They are seeing the lightning. They are having the boat come in with all the water. Everything is transpiring there. Where is Jesus in the middle of that storm? Right next to the disciples. He was right there in the middle of it. Maybe you can be saying, God did not come to call us out of the curse he came to be with us in the curse because he has a purpose for us in this world. And if we, if we don't look at it from this angle, we're never going to understand this. Guys, as long as you are in this circle, and you are, every single one of you, you're going to have family stress. Regardless if you have Jesus or not, marrying Joseph as a baby or us physically with the Spirit of God, you're still in this curse. It, it, you're you're going to have challenges. You're going to have finances. You're going to have problems you're going to be frustrated as parents. You're going to have scheduling conflicts. You're going to have all these things that do not make sense in our life. Jesus said in John 16, These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. That's what he said. Just in the world, as long as you're in this world, as long as you're standing for me, as long as you're going to have problems but later we realize where it all comes together because at the end of this is, but be good cheer, I have overcome the world. So here we are in the middle of all this. And here's what they did have with Jesus. They had the leading of God. You see, God led Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God led Mary and Joseph. And I tell you, if we have Jesus, God's leading us too. In the middle of all of this, he led them to these places of being challenged. He led to them that city that there was no room. He led them to the place where they were chased down by Herod. And all of that, they still had Jesus, but they had the leading of God. If God leads you, let me tell you this. It might not feel okay, but it will always be okay with Jesus. It, it might feel like things are not falling, or falling apart, but I'll tell you, God has a way of always working things out. The world might be crazy, but I'll tell you, God is with us in the midst of the crazy say, why, why was his world not falling apart? Here, here is Matthew 120. Let's look at this. This is how our God works. Man, you're in the curse. Lord, I don't know what to do with my kids. And Lord, I don't know why you're changing things. And Lord, I can't handle this. Notice what God does. Matthew 120. But while he thought on these things, isn't that where most of our battles come from right there? Just saying us as a church, while he thought on these things. Me and Mrs. Dunoff actually talked about that on Friday when we were all together. Just while we thought on these things. Man, half the battle that we deal with in this world is in our minds. 
Joseph is trying to figure out, what am I going to do? I love her, but I can't. And God saw that. God knows that. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you what we have as Christians in the world and all the mess and all the stress and all the chaos and everything else. We have a God that reaches into the craziness and calms us when we, when we don't know what to do. And that's exactly, just so you guys get it, that's exactly what happened in this passage. God was calming him in this. God was speaking. God might not speak to us in this way. And thank God we don't have to. Hey, this is a blessing. You say, man, that'd be so cool if God worked that way. I would hate to have to wait for an angel to stop by my house to know what to do. You know what I'm saying? Are you saying, well, that was good. Now we have the presence of the Holy Spirit. We have the scriptures with us and all these other things that God uh, gives us. But God calms our fears. God came to him in a time of need. God, God did this. God did this later in the dream. In Matthew 2, 13. And after the uh, Magi departed, when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. You say, I'm in this crazy, I'm in this world, I'm in this curse. God, I don't know what to do. Do you not like me? And God says, Oh, whoa, 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 wait there. I'm going to tell you what to do. I've got a plan to get you out. I know where I'm going to take you, and I know why I'm taking you there. Every bit of that. We've got to understand that we've got the guidance of God inside of our lives. Number two, through through having Jesus in their life, they had the provision of God. God provides for our needs. See, the the angel was the fulfillment and everything that happened within this, everything that, that God was doing on purpose. But God had a way of meeting their needs. Do you realize in Matthew 2.11, and a lot of times we overlook this, you can imagine Mary and Joseph, they taken off. They didn't come from rich heritage. I'm not saying, I, I don't know how much money they had in their pocket. I'm not going to try to do that. But the description was, he, he came from lowly estate. She came from a low estate. They, they, they didn't come from any position of authority or, or finances or whatever. But then all of a sudden, these men, this caravan, however many people was there, in Matthew 2, 11, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me ask you guys, what is a two-year-old, however he was, two, three-year-old in that range somewhere in there, do with gold, frankincense, and myrrh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, what is he going to do with that? I'll tell you what God was doing. God was taking care of Mary and Joseph to take care of the mission of God. You talk about not, not having any idea how God's going to provide for your needs. So I, I have no idea how God's going to get me through. And all of a sudden, they get a knock on the door, and you're sitting, Lord, you said you'd take care of us. And well, there's, there's these kings lined up at the door. Kings. Yeah, a whole caravan. And, they, and all their servants come in and start laying down these gifts. You talk about an unexpected blessing that came from the middle of nowhere. That's how God works. That's how God always works. God... God not only provided for their needs, God provided confirmation. This is what we get as Christians from our God. Luke 2, 18, And all that heard and wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But listen to this, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Have you ever stopped to look at that verse right there in the middle of this Christmas story? Here they are, the shepherds go out, they're cheering, they're praising God, they're doing all these different things. Joseph's over there playing with Jesus. And Mary just goes off to the corner. Say, Lord, I don't get all this, but you sure are working. You know, you can imagine what, whatever that verse means right there. She took all these things in, the shepherds and the angel announcement and everything that's going on, and she began just to think in her heart. That's what God does. God speaks to us. God works in mysterious ways just to say, I am in the middle of this. I will take care of you. I have a plan, and I will get you through third thing we see when you have Jesus you have the protection of God in Luke 1 26 in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Gal- Galilee named Nazareth now, now all this is just cool and of itself to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph the house of David the virgin's name was Mary 
And it goes down to all, all the description of the angel coming and explaining. And you guys, we, we read this at Christmas and we tell this story. But look down at verse uh, 28 at the end of this. Hail that thou art highly, fa- highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Mary, let me, let me tell you this. It doesn't matter. You have no idea what you're going to face when you walk out of here. From Herod wanting to chase you down. From the, the, from the opposition that you're going to face to when you get there, not having a place to stay and everything, but I can promise you that the Lord is with you. So how many of you have parental stress? Let me tell you right now, I'm just going to tell you, the Lord is with you. He is. He said, well, then why do I have this stress? Because you're in the curse. Because you are in this world. Because you are in this struggle. God meets us where we're at. One day he will take us out. Praise God for that part. Praise the Lord that we're not stuck in this. Praise the Lord God that this isn't the end of it. But she had the protection of God. Let's finish with this. So we looked at, I promise you, living with Jesus means that we still face problems. Number two, living with Jesus means that we have Jesus in our problems. Number three, living life with Jesus always brings fulfillment. Now, they, they didn't see all this, but I tell you, in every single one of our lives, from our parenting struggles, to our lives being turned upside down, to being relocated, to the, the, to the, the problems that we have raising our kids, or even with our, in our marriage, and everything that happens, they're just like, why is this happening now? The Bible tells us that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Well, let me tell you, Mary and Joseph were obviously called according to God's purpose. But as saints of God and Christians and people that go to church, every one of us here right now are called according to his purpose. Let me put it like this. God has a purpose for everything going on in your life. God has a purpose for what he's doing. There is a purpose. Now I can tell you, when, when, when Joseph wakes up Mary in the middle of the night and says, Mary, we have to go. God told me that our son's going to be killed unless we go now. You're, you're not sitting there going, praise God for the purpose. You know, no, nobody's thinking that. When they were on their way back to Jerusalem and they've gone three days sorrowing over Jesus, the last thing on their mind is, well, I thank God for the purpose. No, you're, you're, you're embracing the pain and the frustration of it at that moment. But it's all of those things that came together for, for good. A lot of you guys will, over the next week or whatever, and a lot of you have already done this, where people get together and they, they make the cookies and all that. And I use, use this illustration with the teens with this verse. The thing is, every aspect of making cookies really is disgusting and, and distasteful. From the salt to the flour to, you know, the eggs. And you take every individual piece and you take the egg and you say, that's just gross. You take the flour, it's gross. You take the yeast and it's gross. You take each individual part and it doesn't taste good. But at the end of it, when God takes our lives and our problems and everything that he's brought us through, all those things work together for good of the product that he was doing. So when Mary was told that this child will save his people from their sins, Matthew 121, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That was what all that was going through. And let me tell you, God has a reason and a purpose for all the craziness that's going on in our lives. So I'd like to tell you guys that it's all easy. And maybe the next time you're sitting there saying, honey, is God just picking on us? And you turn around and say, no, this is just part of it. God is with us. God has a reason for us. God's going to bless us through this. You know, I, I, I say that because I, I have to live this. Let me tell you, every challenge that you guys have as being a parent or facing life or challenges or the unexpected in our life, we all face it. I want to say that it's not just true with life. It's true with even us as a church. You know, it doesn't always make sense. We, we had a testimony time uh, with our staff and and uh, Pastor Michael stood up and he was saying, he said, you know, you know what, this was a learning year for us. Because we, we had a, a lot of challenges. And, and going into uh, the year, we, we had big expectations of what we were going to knock out with the, the remodel project and all that. And, and all it seemed to be is headache after headache after headache. It did. You, you guys have it from the perspective of parenting. And, and then it rolls over into some of us in a leadership role of this just doesn't make sense. You know, I'm going to God just saying, Lord, 
I, I, I know you led us to do this, and I know good's going to come from this, and I know you're leading in this, but nothing is making sense. And then we have to realize and step back and realize just in these situations that God has a way of doing things that don't always make sense. But he has a good reason for it. We face these struggles, but we learn through them. We all learn through these as we go through this. And I don't regret any of the things. And I wanted to kind of give you guys as we roll in the second part some just thoughts on my heart and some updates and look at, look at the year that we're about to have. I'm excited about this year. Uh, I don't regret these remodel projects that we're getting into, but I can promise you I never expected so many challenges. And all the people that are in leadership in the church, they know what I'm talking about that has been through these things. The, the, the littlest thing I, who would have ever thought would be just such a hassle. You say, why, do, why don't we have mud on the drywall yet? Because the city won't let us. That's why. Because the screw pattern of the screws on the drywall didn't match up directly with what they wanted the screw pattern to be. So now we're having to go back to adjust the screw pattern of the drywall. And, and you know what? That's their rule, so we'll go by it. But it means that we had to go back to the architect that had to write a letter to, to the city, and then they had to adjust the plans, and then it had to be sent there, and then we have to adjust them on our end, and then we call in the inspector for them to come back and look at the screw pattern so that we can put mud on top of the screws so we can eventually get the paint. He said, that's crazy. It is crazy. But God's in control. Amen. And, and I just know through all of these things, learn back and just say, Look at all the blessings of that because God's been in the midst of all this. Let me tell you, when we went through this and they came out and the crazy amount that we had to pay for the plans and permits and stuff like that, and they said that we were going to have to use contractors. And I know I've said this a, a lot of times, but I'll tell you, that stressed me out so bad because contractors would cost triple the amount of, of just getting lay people in the church. But you realize that 90% of all the contractors that did that came from men and their businesses within our church. You say, what's the big deal about that? We didn't know what was going to happen, and God provided all that. That's what's the big deal about that. God takes care of us. The other thing uh, that God has blessed through this is we've been paying cash for this project. And, of course, that slows things down, but God has provided even in the midst of everything costing way more than what we thought because of these challenges and meeting the codes and screw patterns and everything else. And so this has cost us a lot more, but God has provided. When we are finished with Big City, it will be first class. And I know I've mentioned some of this in the past, but, but we are installing security cameras through that whole thing. It will have security locks and we'll be able to lock down that facility at any moment. And nobody will be able to get in if we ever have a situation and I know we used to think that that stuff was unnecessary, but I tell you, the more that we watch the news and the stuff that has happened, it reminds us of how important these things are nowadays. The secure bathrooms that will be handicap accessible, that, that we've gone out of our way to improve those, and the chairlift that will be at the steps, the check-in station and the guest registration and the new windows and forced heat and air and all the rooms and all that other stuff, and no longer having to use just the baseboard and the, uh, the heating system that we had before. But right now, we are waiting for that final inspection on the drywall. Once that happens, we'll go into the mud and be able to mud it and uh, put the drywall mud on there. And then we'll right into paint, lights, doors, carpet, all that other stuff. And you guys probably even walked past today and saw that we do have uh, progress on that even from last week. But our green opening of that for next year of just putting a safe, we'll be having it ready for Easter. Easter is early this year. It means that we're going to be do, finishing this project on top of building the stage and everything like that. But I think everything is on schedule. We'll be able to do that and use that. I want you guys to know that we've already started working on the plans for phase two. Actually, we're, we're at the end of the planning for that. And those plans are very expensive. It, none of that stuff is easy in doing it this way. And uh, for the new teen department, the teen department is where uh, the children's ministry is being remodeled now. And those teens will be relocated to the second floor of the first building over there. And that will be gutted out and made into the teen department. And we'll do that. But here's how it's going to work. Once we finish up Big City, once we finish that up, then it will just be a matter of the money that we step forward to make the progress as the money comes in. The money comes in quick, we're able to do it quickly. If it comes in slow, but God answered and supplied for this. And I know he's going to do that same way again. I wanted to go through our calendar, and uh, if we had the plans to make sure that everybody had one, we had two or three things on the calendar that Richard brought to me right as we were getting ready to print. 
that were just conflicts. And I did not want to print the calendar to have to go back and say, later you have the good one or the bad one. So it should be this week that you guys will have that in printed form. Uh, but in all of this, I want to make sure that we're doing everything according to what God's called us to do. We are a family that makes disciples to love God, love others, and serve both. That is what we do. And I tell you, I never want to get off. I hope you guys have the same heart with that. I never want to be called a busy church that's not being a productive church. Busy doesn't always mean that we're doing what's right. We can be busy doing a lot of things and not doing what's right. So we have to check ourselves. Are we accomplishing our goals? Do the things that we do lead people to a relationship with Jesus Christ, either by making them stronger in their walk with God or by leading them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ? And so here's where we're at right now, the 2018. Uh, something that we're, you'll see on the calendar that is new, and we're pushing this, and you heard about this morning, January 20th, Saturday, we're having a volunteer appreciation party. Not a banquet, but a party. For every person in our church that serves, uh, from uh, choir all the way down to the ushers at the door, everybody, we want one room at one time, number one, to say thank you. We could not do what we do without servants in our church. We could not. And a lot of times people, they don't even realize how many people serve in this church. We want, we want you to see who's all serving. We want to encourage you. We want to thank you. And we want to just plug you into what God's going to do in the coming year. Uh, April 1st is Easter of next year. You'll see that on the calendar. And uh, we are still planning on doing the three weeks. And you say, why? Well, once again, we check it. Is this working? Because we have to do that. Is this working? It's not something we did before. We did Christmas, and then we moved it to Easter, and then I had the crazy idea, what if we got them back three weeks in a row? Last year, for the two following weeks, we had over 1,000 people for those weeks. We had around 2,000 people for Easter and over 1,000 people the following weeks. Guys, that is great. If we can get people back to preach on the judgment of Christ and, and God coming back and what it means to be saved, and we do that with a crowd three weeks in a row— it's successful, and that's why we're doing that. I want you guys to know right now, just unveiling it, the title of our play for Easter of 2018 is Jesus. It's Jesus. That name is going to be on that wall out there, and it's going to be the size of a building. And people are every day going to drive by and read the name Jesus. Tens of thousands of flyers are going to go out of, our out of our church, and it's going to have all over it the name Jesus. We're going to preach Jesus. And you say, we always preach Jesus. Yes, we do. But normally, what we try to do is we take a side character, we tell the story of Jesus through that character. Our main character this year is going to be Jesus. So we're going to, from every angle as we do this, talk about the love, the compassion, the sacrifice, the mission, the grace of our God. And tell that we have some creative ways of doing that. The following week, we're going to do the reality of death. Last year, we did the rapture. I tell you, God laid it on my heart. Not everybody is anticipating the rapture, but you know, and I know it's coming. But I tell you, people die and go to hell every single day. Every day. And I told the team when we were there, I'd love to do a drama the following week that brings it from the Bible days up into the reality Something of a confrontation of taking somebody that's been presented the gospel, them rejecting them, them dying. And instead of the third week having the judgment, have it the second week. And the drama ends that day with them standing before God, accountable for rejecting God. Then the third week will be different. The third week normally in the past, we open it up with the judgment. And then we had the heaven scene at the end. This is what the Lord laid on my heart, and when you see it, you'll understand why. I want the third week not to be about the judgment, because that's what we're doing the second week, but the third week to be all about heaven. I think Christians need to be encouraged with that, and we're planning on ending the drama differently than we've done it before. In the past, we've ended the drama by getting up, and we have everybody, and we lift up the crowns, and we, we, we do things. And, and guys, just so I know, if we get into this in some aspects of this change, but I'm just casting vision, I'm sharing my heart with you. We found a worship song that talks about heaven and praising God. And I told them what I would love to do is have this audience or this crowd turn around, have Jesus set back down, and we just worship and sing to the King of Kings instead of just being entertained by it and lead the congregation in this worship song as we close out. I think it's going to be very powerful. Our vacation Bible school has been great. And I can say 
to you guys as a church. God has blessed our Bible school where it has grown year after year after year. And uh, when I first came to the church, um, we, we did it a lot different. We really did. We had teens outside and we had in, in the garden and we did all that. And then we had the younger kids and older kids and it was really big. And then we try to focus in just on that uh, school age from the ages of 6 to 11. And man, God is really, really blessed with this. Um, I'm thankful for it. And uh, Pastor Dave has big vision. I'm not going to give you, Dave, the, the mic because I'll tell you, he'd be here for an hour talking about his vision for what he's doing this year. A major change. I want you guys to hear me out on why I'm doing this and why I feel like, I'm telling you, as a pastor, I'm telling you why I feel like God has heavily laid this on my heart for a major change. I do not want to have the carnival again. I do not want to have the carnival again. And you guys hear me out as I do this. I had to have a hard look at it, and I would have never thought of this without going through a year that we got rained out. And I thought, what is the purpose for it? Do we evangelize at the carnival? No. We've tried. It's just you can't compete with funnel cakes and, you know, rides. Number two, do we disciple? We don't. Number three, does it provide fellowship and spiritual growth for us as a church? No. So I thought, what does it do? Well, what we realized is it used to be used as a treat for the fifth day. Well, I'll tell you, they get a treat Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Our, our whole Bible school is a draw in of itself. But what I've realized through this is we are putting ourselves into a position where we wear out our people that week. We expect more out of them than we do most times. Now, here's what we do. We ask them to work the weeks to set up. Then on Father's Day, we set up in the church and we put everything in place. Then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're here. Friday morning till night, we work setting up. We clean up in the middle of the night. We come back Saturday morning. Then we clean up again. We clean up through that day. And then what we have on Sunday, one of the lowest Sundays of the year. We step back. That's what we do. We wear our people out so much that there's never a break that by Sunday, most people or a lot of people don't show, it up, show up because they're worn out because we never gave them a break. There's a sign-up sheet from that end to the, at that end getting people to sign up to do something every single day. Let me tell you, there's got to be balance. And I'm not taking things away that is evangelism or changing people's lives, but if there's something in the middle of it that accomplishes the same goal, that the Ohio State Fair is doing it, then let them do it and not us. Now, I'm just telling you guys from my heart. On top of that, we take on liability through the food serving and small kids be disappearing and the rides and everything like that. And I'm thinking, why would we risk the liability? I'd rather put that into Bible school. So our idea is on Thursday when we close it out, Friday will be our cleanup of what we do and tearing down everything and then have everybody take Saturday off and then hit Sunday hard. And our goal of hitting Sunday hard is to pull everybody back to where we invite the parents back and maybe do awards or something like that where we give them an incentive to come to church instead of the incentive of coming to a carnival. Now, I know not everybody is going to understand that, but I'll tell you, if you walk the walk of it, you would. It'd be a lot different. And I care more about the health of the church than just something that provides entertainment. That's my heart. And so that's one of the things... Another thing that we're going to do on the calendar that we're excited about is uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to mark the beginning and end of our summer. The reason why we're doing that is because we know school gets out about a certain time. We're going to transition into Cadets for Christ. We're going to transition out of Awana and then back into Awana at the end. We want a clear start and stop date. And for that, as, as us, as a church, as we go through the summer, man, I really want to be able to pull everybody together and do some really cool fellowships. I know life groups don't go through there. We have the Bible study. Our Bible study almost grows on those Wednesday nights. And I want to creatively do some things with that for us as a church to go through a series together, for us to be able to have time of fellowship and it kind of being a time that we can gel through that. It's not a really major change except for on the calendar when you see it says summer begins and summer ends. We're just kind of doing what with most schedules are, but we're just going to go along with that with our teaching series, preaching series, and some of the fellowships that we do with that. Um, also, something that Pastor Dave and I, we've brainstormed over and uh, with our trigger treat, man, it was it was it was so big. Uh, and when I say so big, it was amazing at that what we had. And we've asked some other pastors uh, and people and said, "How? What can we do to make this effective?" Because really, 
Bob can testify back there, <laughs> uh, our, our police officer. Wave at everybody, Bob. Was it crazy? <laughs> and so when they said that we started shutting down Hamilton Road and these other stores and the, uh, our roads and things like we had to do things. And somebody asked us and said, why do you host all that at the church and rather than taking that from the church into your community? This is something we're going to try this year with the Trigger or Treat Outreach, okay? We're going to try to get teams of people to go into all the neighborhoods around the church and set up these things. Now, it won't be the size of what we had here by any means. But at the same time, at some point, there's only so much we can do. We can't go earlier. We can't go later with that. And so we, we have to figure out how to make this work. So our idea with this is to divide up in the teams and have about 15, 20, 25, who knows how many of these things we could have, and see how many contacts we can make through our neighborhoods collectively as a church. You say, I don't know if that's going to work. And you could say all the list of, that we did this year that was good. Let me agree with you. It was good. But I'm afraid at some level that it won't be good and it could hurt our testimony instead of help our testimony. Our goal, our mission, is not to step back and say how many people we had. Our goal is to reach people's lives. And I know that people coming through our numbers and things like that, and when they, here's what I'm going to tell you guys. Here I am, Pastor Tony, before you. We're going to try. If it doesn't work, we'll go back. But I'm not going to take an opportunity that we could do something creatively different that could impact more people's lives and not take advantage of it. And so this is, this is just an opportunity for us to do this. Another thing that we really want to do is take a greater emphasis on missions. Man, this, is, this has got to be not just part of our church. It has got to be the passion of our church. Guys, do you agree with that? It has got to be the passion of our church. And I feel like it, missions in America is struggling. So when it comes to October, we're not going to have a missions weekend. We're going to have a missions month, okay? It's going to be we're through the month of October we put the emphasis on missions. And I want, to, I want to see our giving increase. I want to see the number of missionaries that we do. I want to see our focus. I want to see our knowledge about missionaries. Everything grow as a church. The first weekend in October, we're going to set the stage and preach on Sunday morning before we would kick our missions conference off on Wednesday night. Do you know who the main people are that show up on Wednesday night? You guys. <laughs> do you realize the difference of the crowd that's here right now versus here this morning? You guys know what I'm talking about? It's, it's not the same. And you know what I have to do if we're going to go forward with missions? I've got to get the people on Sunday morning that is part of our church on board with the mission of what we do when we gather on Wednesday night, gathering about that missions conference. So here's what we're going to do with this. We're going to kick it off that first week. The second week is when we're going to bring in our missionaries. We're going to have a big day, bring them up, share with the church who they are, what they're doing, where they're going, all those kind of things. And then instead of having the banquet on Friday night, we're going to have the banquet that night on that Sunday with all the missionaries being here. Now we'll do the banquet and then we'll do like we've done in the past where we break them into the classrooms. We get to go from class to class here in front of them and then bring us back. Everything we do, we're doing the same way that we did before. We're just shifting it around because we've realized with schedules, families and things like that, it's hard for people to get, harder for people to get here on Friday. But if you guys notice, we did this with the BEMA conference this past um, year over the uh over our missions time and man it, it god bless it it was a huge turnout and a lot of people came out we want to do that and then the following sunday is going to be our faith promise sunday that means people have had three weeks to pray about it hear about it and, and be part, part of this on the fourth sunday we are bringing in an evangelist that is um going to do an equip conference equip meeting he's preaching all morning and then into that evening with us as a church, we're all coming together for this to do a series on apologetics. Now, a lot of you guys might not understand what apologetics is. Apologetics is teaching people and equipping people how to defend their faith. Literally meaning when our young people are asked or even you guys are asked, do you believe in God and is the Bible true? We can show them from scripture how these things are right. And I'm, I'm passionate. So that whole month is going to be equipping Another thing that we want to do is make a really big push in this next year out of communion and baptism. Now here is this. Baptisms, we want to make a big push and then uh, have the families come in to see their family being baptized. And you say, why are you doing this? Number one, baptism is an outward profession of their faith. 
And we're going to get people that are going to come in to support their family that might not normally come to church. And then our goal is afterwards is to have almost like a party or a celebration or a reception where we invite them back to Fellowship Hall, all the ones that were baptized on that day and their families, and we're going to strategically go out of our way to build relationships with their families. He said, what is the purpose of that? The purpose is being fishers of men. That's what it is. To go after people, to love them, to show them that what they did was a big deal, to teach them and lead them through the next steps and, and things like that. There's a second um, thing that we have as a um, ordinance of the church, and that is communion. So you guys help me with this. I want to make our communion the best that it can be because I feel like sometimes we just tack it on and we just go through the motions of it because we've done it for so long. The Bible takes communion very important. And guys, with communion, when we do communion, that is something that is supposed to be done with the church, focusing on the blood, the body, the forgiveness, the restoration, all these things that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ in this relationship. So you're guys going to see as we put these on the calendar that we're going to strategically do it in such a way that we make a big deal out of our communion services. It won't be every month that we have it like every other month that we come together. We pause, we focus, we pray. We pray, we put our attention on who God is and what it's about. And, and I'm not saying that we've done it wrong in the past. All I'm saying is I want to do it better in the future. And I, I think this is important for us to uh, zone in on this. Another thing, I want you guys to hear my heart on this and why this is so important with communion. Communion is an ordinance of the church, which literally means that it's something that God commanded the body of believers to do. You're going to see something that I'm doing next year that I already did this year, but nobody understood why. I do not want to have candlelight communion anymore on Christmas Eve. We will have a Christmas Eve service, but not candlelight communion. Stop and think about it for a minute. Who is communion for? Who is communion for? You guys tell me. For the believers. It's for us. I don't know who all is coming on that family night. And I don't want to stop and restrict people from coming. And I don't want to take an ordinance of the church and promote it like an event. Communion's not an event. It's an ordinance of the church. So what we'll do is the Sunday before Christmas every year, we will have our communion service. And then what we normally do for that service, which is a celebration, Christmas songs, the gospel story, we're going to move that to Christmas Eve. You know why? Because I want you guys to go to Hogwild to invite your lost neighbors, your friends, your relatives, your cousins, anybody and everybody you can get and have there without me as a pastor having to sit there thinking, pass out communion to every soul here that I have no idea who they are and if they're saved. And then lift it up like it's just some sort of celebration, which it is to us as Christians, but it should not be to somebody that's lost. Do you guys hear that from me as a pastor? It's not a matter of me, and I know people like, well, we've done that this way and that. It's not that we've done it wrong. I've done it this way. I love it. I absolutely love the atmosphere. We'll still have the atmosphere. We'll still do it. But man, I'd rather on Christmas Eve go get the place filled with people and then tell them about the gospel story and lead them to salvation. So that's the goal. What we do, we want to do better. Guys, I know uh, our uh, challenge with uh, praying for a worship leader, and uh, I brought a guy in a while back, and i just be honest, there was nothing wrong with it. I could not get up here and say there's something wrong. I just didn't have peace. Talked to a number of other leaders. They didn't have peace. It's got to be the right guy. I love that guy. His name was Andy. We're still friends today. We still talk today. I just told him, I said, Andy, I have nothing to tell you other than the fact that I don't feel like it's right. He said, man, I have peace in the same way, and that's all right. God has a plan. We're going to still move forward with this. Pastor Chris has been helping us with the college ministry, and he's going to continue to do that into the new year. Praise the Lord for that. We we need that. I, I don't want to neglect that area, and we've got some ideas of how we're going to improve that and make that better and do our very best. I don't want it to be a lag time. Uh, Matt has helped us tremendously with the music and organizing that. And we're looking forward to kicking things off with that coming up. I, I want to do a better job communicating with you guys. I, I, it's a hard thing. I'm just being honest. I feel we, we got the comments back and some people said, I don't know what's going on in these areas. And then the other comment says, I feel like the announcements go on forever in church. And I'm like, man, how do you fix that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I know both of them are right because 
we, we didn't do a lot of greater things updates because there wasn't a lot of things. It was red tape, red tape, red tape. And I didn't want to come up and say, we're jumping through another hoop. You know, and I didn't want to be discouraging. But I didn't want to leave you guys in the dark. And if I did that, I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. But I want you guys to know what's going on and I want to get it done. The other thing is, we, in our goal for next year is to finish both projects. And you guys, you say, with the money and how things have advanced, because just the plans so far for the plans is over $20,000 just for that other. It's out of my hands. It's just what it takes. That's a lot of money. So I gotta, I've got to get the money together through our, our giving and anything just to pay for the plans before we even start the project. But I'm telling you this because our God is able. And I feel like God has great things for us ahead of us as a church. And I think that it's important for us to push forward. So here's the thing. As your pastor, if you say, Tony, we want to know more about something to ask me, okay? And I mean that. If I'm not communicating something in a right way or whatever, and that's why I'm telling you about communion and how we're going to try to focus in more on that and spread those out through the year and do those strategic, uh, that's why I wanted you guys to know why we're doing what we're doing for Easter and my heart for the, the carnival. I mean, I'm, I'm the carnival director. It was hard for me to come to this. But when God laid it on my heart, I knew that there was a reason because I want to put those efforts more into something evangelistic rather than just something entertaining. So I'm forgetting something. Pastor Dave, did you want to do the last one before? Okay, are you sure? Okay, I'll do it. All right, one last change on the calendar. In our fall, we hit a spot that is extremely busy. It's the close of the summer, us getting ready for missions, us having our anniversary Sunday, um, all the other things, starting Awana, um, all these other things. There was an event that happened right in the middle of it that we're not going to do this year, but we will do next year, okay? It's the dinner show. Don't shoot me. I know. It's fun. We laugh. It's goofy, all this stuff. I about cried when we did that. We just could not plug it into the calendar without doing this, where it overlaps. It's an announcement on top of announcement and on top of this. And I told them, guys, I said, if there's going to be something that's, that's going to take precedence over everything else and going to be emphasized and big, I said, I want to stretch out missions and bump something like that any day of the week. And it's not that we couldn't have, we, we have an evangelist coming in on our uh, anniversary Sunday and the singing and all that other stuff. Man, and we're just going to make a big deal, but there was just no way to put that in. So we just decided that we're going to move that to the following year. We don't want to do away with it because we love it. Do you guys like it? Yeah. Do you hear that, Pastor Dave? They all love it. <laughs> Anyways, we were all bummed about it. I, I know that I, I love it, but at the same time, I want to make sure that we're, we're, we're balanced on our schedule and keeping things. And so I love you guys. I'm thankful for a great year. I'm excited about another year. And we have a number, number of other things going to happen. You'll see it on the calendar. We have uh, evangelists coming in. We have some special days and training and just different things like that we're going to do. Uh, but we just want to do all that we do to the glory of God. And like I said, if we make a change and we say that didn't work, we're human. We'll fix it. We'll try again. We'll get back up and change the calendar and go at 2019 with the best that we can. But whatever we do, we want to be productive. We want to glorify God. We want to accomplish our purpose. And we want to do it unified as a church.